Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. I'm coming at you from Jason Matzinger's living room. Yep. (laughs) Welcome. (laughs) I literally called Jason two days ago and was like, hey, I'm going through Bozeman. You want to hang out and have dinner? He's like, yeah. Do you want to stay in my basement? I'm like, yes, (laughs) I do want to stay in your basement. So here I am in my pajamas and uh, on a Friday morning and petting his dog, drinking coffee. It's not a bad deal. No, it's nice it's even uh, a little warmer today sun shining it's like minus 12 <laughs> is in warmer yeah yeah, yeah. warming right up so yeah. no it's good to have you guys yeah no it's great jason has the softest carpet like <laughs> you're like why are you talking about this but it's a thing like you're in his house what i love about jason's house is there's trophies everywhere number one so everywhere you look there's a story so we were up till almost one o'clock last night talking about shed antlers you've found or different hunts. And that's what I love about visiting people in their home is, you know, people take trophy hunting as, this, oh, it's just dead animal, but it's a memory, you know. And, and everywhere you go in your house is this, like, incredible memory and story to go with with everything in here. And then it's so warm in here and, like, cozy <laughs> and the carpet's soft. I'm like, just going to move into Jason's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a nice spot here just outside of Bozeman and – sits up against the mountains here it's a great spot to raise the two boys and let them be boys play outside in the field in the Mm -hmm. creek get dirty all that stuff for sure oh it's so beautiful you look out the back window and there's big mountains there and um it's everywhere you look is beautiful you can see the city of bozeman from here we're kind of elevated and it's just a great spot Um, thank you and yesterday was um yogi and i's wedding anniversary and I told Yogi, I said, there's nobody I'd rather spend our wedding anniversary with than Jason Matzinger. I mean, not only do you appeal to the Instagram gals out there, <laughs> married women love you too. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Uh... I've been holding this joke in all night long. <laughs> well, I did not know it was your guys' anniversary. No, we, so... we were so busy yesterday. And I feel like, like both of us were luckily on the same page because... Like Christmas, Valentine's Day, birthdays. I'm like, hey, happy birthday. I love you. Mwah. That's it. Like Christmas, kind of the same thing. Like, hey, Merry Christmas. You know, we're going to decorate. and But we're not like this um, couple that I'm like expecting like Louis Vuitton, which I actually don't even own anything. Louis Vuitton, you <laughs> just put that out there. It's We're silent um, celebrators in a way, you know, which is, I think, pretty awesome. No, uh, nothing wrong with that. We celebrated. We went to Stacy's last night. The coolest and... place. If you guys are in the <laughs> Bozeman area, any of you, you have to go to Stacy's. It is great food, great drinks. They had a band last night, and, well, he's a one-man band, um, and it was so awesome. The the, the it, Everything in there is like true western montana yeah it's that place so has awesome. been there since since i was a little kid and even before that it's got a lot of history there <clears throat> they had these i have a new life goal thanks to stacy's restaurant and bar they have a picture of a man on a wall and he has a bull elk and he's packing a deer with it and i'm like man this just really <laughs> sets the bar of life accomplishment that i need to like I got to step it up a little bit. You yeah. Know, it's as a, fo- as a hunter slash photographer, it's fun to go in there and look because oh. of the photos on the wall, the history, like, yeah, the, the elk pack and the deer and the buffalo jumping off of stuff. The and high the, dive. Yeah. There's a, a guy riding a bull in the bar. It's um, crazy. There's, yeah, it's, it's a neat spot. So it's a great spot. I was like, happy to uh, take you guys there and I guess celebrate your anniversary. Yeah. Nobody even knew, but it's so weird. We're like there <laughs> one year, uh, which, you know, we didn't get married till I was 41 and, or for, I was, I guess I was technically 40 then, but 
like I never thought it would happen and now I'm like oh years gone by wow time flies when you're out in the field hunting and doing what you love so that's not a bad thing and I've got Jason's dog champ here in my lap which is my new best friend <laughs> <clears throat> I would steal him but I don't think I could pry him away from you like seriously this dog no. is like your little he'd, shadow he'd rip your ankles off <laughs> he has one eye little champ <laughs> lost an eye poor thing in a steak fight <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, I get it yep. I get it you know yeah oh. But no, it's uh, it's great to be here in Montana and it's great to connect with you. Like we've known each other for a long time, but we've only actually done one hunt together Yep. with our MEF. We did a mule deer hunt a long time ago. Yeah. I was trying to think, I think, um, let's see, that would have been maybe 15 or 16. Yeah. Somewhere around there. 14, maybe even. Hunt, went and hunted with Lloyd Ketchum and David Allen yeah. and you and I for mule deer, rutting deer out in eastern Montana. It was a cold, super fun hunt. We timed it just right. Yeah. And yeah, the deer that's the moving. only hunt we ever have done. But yeah, we've known each other for a really <coughs> long time. I actually remember the very first thing I ever saw of you on anything was a spring bear hunt you did with Rocky Jacobson oh, yeah. in uh -huh. Idaho and killed a Giant. Just a massive bear that, and that was a cool story. You guys were in the back country and yeah. you had the mules or horses there and packed them out and the whole works. And it was just like, wow, you could tell, um, you know, you were legit from the first That's time fun. that I saw your stuff. It was like, okay, this, this woman knows what she's doing. And, and yeah, met short time after and, and kind of. Ago you know, grown in the industry together and worked alongside of each other with various, you know, partners through the years. But yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to see where everybody started and where they are now and how everybody has to constantly adapt. You know, I think I had this vision that once I got a TV show or sponsors that it was just going to be this, you know, sit back and just figure out where you're going to hunt next. Yeah. And, the one thing I've learned through having friends like you and Jana and Willie and just our group of friends is it's a constant battle. No matter how long you've been at it, you've got to continue to evolve. And, you know, the platforms are always changing what, what's catching, what's not. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's fun to have you guys here and be able to talk about that kind of stuff and just kind of bounce notes off of each other what works what doesn't mm -hmm. and try to try to help each other that's why I've always done that turkey camp every year is yeah. just like a big team building kind of thing where we get everybody together and yeah just try to help each other like things that have worked camera gear that works whatever it may be yeah you know and it's super fun turkey hunting is like the last the least important part of that camp. Yeah. Well, your success <laughs> rate reflects that, Jason. <laughs> I know. I've never claimed to be a turkey hunter. And no, I'm I mean, it's just, <laughs> I just, Western turkey hunting is, can be a tremendous challenge. Um, and it's not, I mean, the birds have such a big area and I, it, they're not, the density is just not there. So finding sure. them in these little pockets of, you know, it's, it's a lot more challenging, uh, than, it, than like an Eastern hunt, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I've heard, I mean, I, I have not hunted <coughs> birds all over, but I've heard that Merriam's are supposedly the dumbest birds, which, I mean, if that's the case, I'm screwed because <laughs> 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 it's only uphill uh, battle from here. But it's funny. But yeah, it, um, it's been cool to see you as a uh, woman figure in the industry and the things that you've done, you know, I think are what sort of brought us together as far as friends and then the people we work with is conservation. You know, yeah. you've always been a super great voice for conservation and, and, um, you know, that's something I value and have a lot of passion for. So I think that we both, you know, realize that if we're, if we're going to be hunters, obviously hunters are the first crusaders of conservation, but you know, it is important to us I think collectively, um, you know, there's a lot of us in, in the outdoor world and obviously hunting community that feels this way that it's the most important resource we have. And if we're going to take from the land, we have to give back more than we 
than we get. And um, that's one thing I've always really respected about everything that you produce and do. It always has this story of why we're there and why it's important and, and what, you know, broader picture are other than the harvest, you know, what is, what is the point behind being, you know, blessed to be on the mountain? Yeah, that's, <coughs> and I think that's how I've been able to find longevity in <coughs> doing television and film production is not because like I'm a better hunter than anybody or I can shoot a bow better or I'm anything better than anybody. Honestly, it's just, I think what's given me that the longevity is always keeping the animal and always keeping the environment, the, um, you know, keeping that as the forefront of the yeah. message and making sure that that's most important. And me being part of that is just like, you know, a secondary part to the story. So like with the project documentary series that I've done, like mm -hmm. project elk, I mean, there is an elk hunt in there, but the whole story is trying to explain to people how hunting is conservation. Yeah. That's the big message there. Project Mule Deer, you know, once again, there's a hunt, a uh, mule deer hunt in there, but the message behind that one is land conservation and access and migration corridors and keeping these chunks of land in one piece so these animals can freely move back and forth and and then the Circle of Life series or a uh, film that I did with Wild Sheep, that was all um, explaining the importance of high dollar auction tags mm -hmm. and how those translate to conservation. And this year at the Sheep Foundation show, it was record setting sheep tags like ev like Wyoming, Oregon, everyone was getting record sales and, and all of that goes directly back to benefit you know, wildlife and, and wild places. And a lot of people, well, it's just for a rich man, it's like, well, <laughs> one tag funds more than almost everybody combined. I mean, the, the, the budgetary uh, benefit from those tags is really tremendous. Yeah, I mean, the amount of money that comes in from one tag that goes to wildlife conservation, if that tag sells for 240000 you know, 230000 of that is going back to make sure that the sheep herd is healthy or, you know, bolster or repopulate new herds. So mm -hmm. one guy spending that money is creating opportunity for more people to, mm -hmm. you know, possibly draw a sheep tag and stuff. So yeah. that's really the story there. And then the last film I completed was Project Landlocked. Mm -hmm. And that one was all just about landlocked property in yeah. the United States. And which is a very controversial topic in Wyoming. We see a lot of legislation happening right now on corner crossing and yeah, and whether that should be allowed or not allowed and and yeah. yeah. So we kind of explored both sides. I mean, I I just laid the information out there. I mean, I definitely you know want to look at other options for opening up this land in the future for for more use than it's getting now i don't know if corner crossing is the answer i 100 yeah. percent support private property mm -hmm. rights and so it is it's a tough topic and a lot of very um you know passionate people on both sides of that one so that that was a tough film and it it dove a little more political than i like to get um i found <laughs> <laughs> you're like oh and, boy <laughs> so it but super proud of that film and how it turned out it was basically taking the landlocked report that onyx and trcp had formulated mm -hmm. um over 22 western states they were they found over 16 million acres that's landlocked inaccessible and um so yeah that like you say every every project has a bigger picture picture to it and and that's really what drives me. You know, I've got the TV show and I'm super proud of what that's accomplished. Mm -hmm. But the real driving force for what I do is those conservation messages. Mm -hmm. And and you're working on a new one right now. Yep. We're just starting on a new one, which you were talking about trophy hunting. The film is titled Selective. And it's on the history of trophy hunting, kind of where it started, why it started where it got a little skewed in the middle, where we are today. But, you know, the big picture is 
it's a beautiful thing Mm -hmm. and it always has been a beautiful thing and it's you know I think it's we have just never really told our story well in a big way in in a way that people outside hunting can understand so I want to kind of well in with that too you have to think uh, you know the antis and in states like California, when they're w- trying to ban bear hunting, they don't show taking a giant, old, mature boar <clears throat> and being selective on what you harvest with dogs. Um, they show baby bears <laughs> right. um, treed with dogs underneath, or in, in, in they just paint this broad brush that is um, not accepted, and, and they don't tell the reality of it. Um, but that's fake news media for you in so many aspects of life as we're all seeing and um you know trophy hunting like you say is is very misunderstood and um you know i i'm proud to take an animal that's beyond its peak that's reached maturity and done its job with breeding and and um it's on its way out and why not give it a beautiful ending to that chapter of life and, and fulfill the circle of life by, you know, nourishing families and, and being something that's a memory that's, that's honored and, and revered for, you know, the rest of your life and and beyond. You bet. Yeah. And I mean, (coughs) from individual aspects like that to just the straight up management and health of the herd. I mean, it's not only feels good to know that you've taken that animal for the reasons you explained but it's also what's best for them yeah you know like we're taking care of them stewards of the land and and that's that's the thing is you know um trophy hunting is you know just another way to say north american model of wildlife conservation and when you when you look at the north american model i mean it's the most successful conservation um you know system ever developed it's the the envy of the world yeah everybody would love to be where we're at so clearly it's a beautiful thing it's done its job it's rebolstered herds to their you know numbers like we've never seen with a lot of animals turkeys elk bears every animal has benefited from the model and it's a hunter driven yeah and hunter founded model like songbirds and beavers and and even non-hunted species have benefited from it and so that's really the story I want to tell and um you know as a community I know working with like Boone and Crockett and wild sheep and stuff you know that word selective is something that we're trying to kind of thread in more and more so mm-hmm. people will say you know selective hunting selective harvest instead, instead of, instead trophy. of trophy. take the word trophy out and i and you'll see that on legislation where um political entities that are trying to pass whatever legislative agenda they'll put the word trophy in there um instead of selective harvest it, if you switched out a word it changes the entire meaning or the um the impression perception of perception it, yeah. that that leaves the general public or population people i mean i never get flack for hunting white-tailed deer but if i shoot a black bear people you know a lot of them were freaking out oh my gosh why would you shoot a bear you're not going to eat that well, why wouldn't i eat that like what's the difference between a white-tailed deer and a black bear it's the same consumptive prof- process and it's part of the north american model where you manage predators and ungulates um and it keeps a he- healthy balance in an ecosystem and you know, why wouldn't this be part of that model why would this particular segment of a model go unchecked just because you can't imagine consuming it or being consumptive right. doesn't mean that it's not um and i think you know hunters and have been you know it's been a tough battle to change the optic of those types of hunts especially with big with big predators yeah i uh <laughs> i don't know if you watch yellowstone or not but yeah. one of my favorite I was lines shamed in this, into watching that <laughs> show okay <laughs> i live in it <laughs> basically here in bozeman but um one of my favorite lines on on the last season was when he got into it with the environmentalist and he said you know how cute does that animal have to be for you to care about it yeah you know and that that's really what it comes down to mm-hmm. You know, there's like this sliding scale for people of what they care about and what they don't. And usually it is emotion and what that animal looks like, you know. 
um, predators just, yeah, they, they draw emotion more than in any other, you know, form of animal out there when it comes to the anti hunters. And it's very misunderstood. I mean, I get messages like, I can't believe you'd shoot a bear and just take its hide and leave the rest. And it's like, who Who's, told you who that? Who said that I did? <laughs> That's You're totally assuming. illegal. If yeah. I did that, my ass would be in jail. Yeah. Well, and I, I wouldn't that, have a yeah. TV show. I was going to say, I mean, you would like, be out of business. Yeah. It's, it, and so then you do take the time to go, well, actually, you know, black bear in the state of Montana is one of the only over-the-counter tags where you have to check that animal in mm -hmm. within 36 hours mm -hmm. of taking it. And because of that, you know, black bears are hard to like keep track of for numbers and, mm -hmm. and like the health of their populations and stuff. So I know like Montana fish, wildlife and parks, they'll pull a tooth, they'll mm -hmm. cut a piece of the tongue, they'll do all these tests on it and, you know. And hunters are fueling the research capabilities of those yeah, and we're uh, paying, biologists. Yeah, we're, and we're paying to be out there on our dollar yeah. to to take these animals that we're hunting, but mm -hmm. then, yeah, we're, turn we're, we're supplying this data for them. So, well, it's 75% of a state budget comes from the sale of hunting licenses and tags. So it's not a drop in the bucket. It is the bucket. Um, 75% of a budget is a tremendous resource that hunters are providing for conservation efforts that everybody gets to enjoy the yeah. benefit of for sure whether so. you hunt or not yeah totally so yeah i mean excited about that film i'm going to be going to the northwest territories and hunting doll sheep mm -hmm. for that because you know hunting sheep at its very core is trophy hunting selective hunting you know even if you got an unlimited tag here in montana mm -hmm you've got to take a ram that's a certain age class right. or it's got to be a full curl or it, it has to meet these criteria and that's because that's what's best for them yeah. not because that's what we decided looks best on our wall so sheep hunting to keep them healthy and to keep them on the mountain is selective hunting and if we did it any other way they wouldn't be here no. and the, the survival rate of a sheep <clears throat> i believe after they reach the age of nine years old is about 10%. So after, you know, when you're looking at a harvest objective of taking nine, 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old rams, <clears throat> and they can get older than that, but the percentage of them that get that old is very, very, very small. When you're selective in that, you're taking an animal that in a hard winter condition, it's most likely they're going to be the one that's not going to survive. And so you are selectively taking and, and it's part of that herd balance. And like you said, it keeps the animals healthy and it keeps them from getting diseased and sick. And, and it's, it, it's a fantastic process that hunters literally are spearheading, but it's with the work of sound wildlife biology and management as well. It's not just hunters saying, I want an old big ram on my wall. It's this is what's best for the wildlife. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited about that one. There's there's still a lot of things between here and the hunt to get through. The border being one of them, <laughs> and where that's all going to be, mm -hmm. and you know, the Russia and U Ukraine. Ukraine, and it's all this is going on right now. So it's it's a very scary time in the world. Yeah, and it's one of those. It's like depending on what's going on, I don't know if I'll want to be that far from my kids. Yeah. you know and. So we'll see, but mm -hmm. that's the plan. That's, that's the next one. And I'm excited about that. We'll release the trailer for that at cheap show next year. Mm -hmm. And then the film will come out, um, next summer at probably the total archery challenge here mm -hmm. in big sky. We're going to shoot that this summer. Are you yeah. here in big sky? We are. Nice. Are you shooting it? Well, yes, I will. Oh. Well, <laughs> So, because we're staying at your house, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, You're like, I'm not going to be home. Get out of my house. <laughs> that's actually the doll sheep hunt. When I get back from that, so my last hunting day is the 27th, and mm -hmm. I think tack starts the 29th mm -hmm. here. So it all depends on travel, but I do plan on at least yeah. the tail end of it yeah. being there. We're going to be there. We, we're bear archery is um, 
partnering on that and they're a big part of that uh, total archery challenge so we're we're excited to go there and and do that with them and um it's gonna be a lot I of love fun them. i've yeah. shot shot a lot of them through the Have years and I, we've never shot one i just heard bring a lot of arrows Yep. Um, and just go there with a good <laughs> good attitude and have some fun. <laughs> yeah, don't take it too seriously or you'll leave mad. Kind of like golf. But, yeah. Um, yeah, lots of arrows and a uh, good group of friends. It's mm-hmm. a good time. I mean, you can, there's guys that are competitive or people that are competitive, but I've never, I've never once, you know, taken score or competed yeah. other than for like a bag of jerky with my buddy we always shoot, shoot for a bag of jerky at the end and yeah that would be <laughs> I would yeah I that's my style I I tend to get really competitive and um when I do my rifle matches like I'm paying attention you know and last year's like one of the first years where I'm like I'm not even looking at practice score at the end of the day I'm just gonna just go have fun and um it's but it, it can be really hard to have that mindset of you're there to just become better at your sport and have a learning experience and, and have a good time. Sometimes if you are competitive like me, it's like you want to go all in and yeah, just got to relax. Yeah. I'm not going to it to compete because I'm not a competitive <laughs> archer. So, uh, well, it just, it's so nice because it's that end of July. So for us, you got two weeks and then archery antelope mm-hmm. starts. And so it's, it, it, it's like the last, like, like if something's not right with your equipment you will sniff it out there yeah. for sure because you're having to watch your bubble you're having all these up and down angles you're having to keep all, you know from your shooting form to your equipment to you will figure out if you're doing something wrong there. yeah and that's what i like about it is it's that last like vote of confidence you get done shooting tack and you feel like okay i'm re- yeah. I'm ready for the I season now i've got it dialed like yeah, you're shooting, and and you know, I I've, I've had a, a lot of people get intimidated by tech because they're like, oh, I can't shoot 120 yards with a bow, and it's like, well, nobody can really. I mean, a few people. I, it's fun to launch every mm-hmm. now and then, but the nice thing about tech is there's four different courses, so you've got like your beginner kid kind of course, then you have like your locals course, which is your basic 3D shoot, then you have like the prime course that's usually like your bombs, your long bombs. And then you have the Sitka course, which is like just ridiculous terrain, Mm -hmm. you know, and there will be like, I remember it was either Big Sky or Park City on the Sitka course this last year. There was like a mile hike between two of the targets. And so it's made to like kind of emulate, get Mm -hmm. your heart rate up, get you tired, and then make you make those hard shots. So you really can just pick where you want to be. And at the end of the day, if you get there and you're like, wow, I can't make this shot, or I've only got two arrows left, I'm not going to send this, then you can walk up to 20 yards and shoot. Nobody cares. Yeah. You know? So it's fun. It's really fun. And it's always just such a good group of people. And, you know, Elk Foundation or Wild Sheep, they usually do like... um, you know, like well, a, a party. Well, does or, elk camp in it, uh, Park City. Yeah. They kind of par- <clears throat> partner with that on, on that deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But even like in Big Sky, they'll have, you know, a party night or, you know, have some beer and come out and little raffle deals. And so there's all kinds of stuff going yeah. on. It's going to be fun. I'm really, lo- we're really looking forward to it. That's um, awesome. You guys are coming out. Yeah, well, we're going to be living, yeah, you're you know, not gonna just be a couple far. hours away. So that's right. Uh, making the old move. Yeah. Yeah. Hey everyone, if you're watching this podcast, then it's probably safe to say that you're like me and you love hunting, shooting sports, and of course you support conservation of wildlife and wild places. I really believe in the power of free market principles. So I want to ask you today to join me in making an impact and consider supporting companies like Ruger, Onyx Hunt and Dead Downwind that are not only supporting this podcast, but they are also supporting the values and traditions that we live out day to day. Thank you all for watching. We just bought, we put an offer on a house, uh, like a, 
early 19 early 1900s house 1906 um it's a renovation and um we just want to you know live in a free state and be closer to be closer to good hunting you know like you're so blessed to be here in bozeman i mean it's gorgeous and where i live in oregon is is also beautiful but um you really are in the heart of of the west here and and that's a really beautiful place when you love western big game hunting to call home yeah for sure i'm lucky to be here in bozeman i think that's a big part of who i've who i am and is where i came from and just the community here i mean i mean now bozeman is like the outdoor hub hub mecca but growing up it it wasn't that it was just a really great small community full of really you know passionate uh outdoorsmen like horsemen yeah you know um yeah, I remember just, you can go not too far, you know, towards Yellowstone and there used to be wall tent cities growing mm-hmm. up when I was little and horses and it was a whole, it was a whole community. And um, it still is. That's, that's why we want to be here is because it's closer to that community. You know, you, you think sure. about all the activities that from people that love shooting guns or shooting bows um, and hunting like there's so many out, outdoor activities that happen in in these areas of the world that you know kind of congregate us to have fellowship and and being close to that I think is pretty awesome like your turkey camp you know hopefully we'll be able to swing in to that at some point this year and um tack and yeah you know there's there's tons of rifle matches in in Wyoming too like I'm um, the night force ELR matches in Wyoming in June and um, I'm either, I think I'm going to shoot that on the RO day and then, um, and then when the actual competition goes around, I've already, you know, you all have already shot the course of fire and I think Yogi and I are going to pitch up and sit with spotting scopes and <laughs> hang out and, and just kind of RO that, that one as well. And, and it's just fun to be, to live in an, a space that they support guns and they support hunting. And, um, right now, culturally, <coughs> excuse me. Right now, culturally, I think it's more important than ever that people f- see the value of guns. And we're seeing that right now in Ukraine where um, the government is begging civilians to take up arms, which they've you know, not allowed them to have arms. And now they're deciding like, hey, there's a reason um, that people have the Second Amendment in the United States. It's for the security of a free state and a free country and, and the, the well-armed, well-trained militia that America has. They don't have that in the Ukraine. But beyond just that, you know, what gun owners are doing for conservation with Pittman-Robertson Act, PR dollars, um, the sale license of taxation of ammunition and firearms and bows, that money is going into conservation and it's transformed American landscape. So, you know, the good that comes from living in a gun supporting community is so impactful, not only for the security of a free country, but also for conservation. And and we're seeing that right now more than ever. And, and with COVID and everything, like I really believe in the power of the purse. And if you don't believe in how your government is spending your money or what the people in your community are doing the only power we have at this point is voting or moving and in some states your vote really I mean in in Oregon we've had mail-in balloting for my entire life and it's never going to go red again I mean there's just in my opinion a lot of fraud that goes in with that and you know for me to live in a state that says okay we want you to show up with ID we want you to come here with your guns. We're going to provide a Second Amendment sanctuary. We're going to provide constitutional hunting practices and protect those 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 traditions and those way of life. And we realize that guns are tied to freedom. And that's where I want to live. Um, and we're literally moving because it has become so important right now in this time of our country that that we live in the places that believe fundamentally in those those truths that we you know they're they're self-evident at this point um and it's crazy to see cnn (laughs) on the news saying well yeah ukraine's taking up arms you know people need to take up arms for freedom was like well what have americans been saying as you try to disarm us like anyway long long rabbit hole there but that has a lot to do with why you know why we're moving is is places like montana places like wyoming that 
fundamentally believe in the value of hunting for conservation and shooting sports and you know gun ownership for freedom and conservation and that's it's a remarkable place to call home when when you have that um, when you step out out your door every day for sure versus fighting for it constantly you know yeah and I guess that's a good good perspective because um you know, I've never had to, I've never lived. In fact, the house that I grew up in is about two and a half miles that way. Mm-hmm. So I, I, the furthest I've ever moved in my life was when I was married <clears throat> and I lived on the ranch on the backside of the mountain, like right here, mm-hmm. you know, so I've never had, I've never moved far and I've always been surrounded by those strong individuals, the ranching community, mm-hmm. the hunting and, and firearms community. And so that's a good perspective because when I look at Bozeman, it's, I mean, it's nothing like it was when I grew up, but you're right. It, it's still as good as it gets. And, yeah. and I do live right, you know, in a, in a great place. I mean, that's why, geez, I feel like everybody is, that has anything to do with hunting has moved to Bozeman in the last yeah. six or seven years, you know, it makes it nice for me because I mean, in ways like, you know, Schnee's is a partner. They're a Bozeman company. Sitka moved here. They're a partner. Um, Montana Canvas, they're here. You know, a lot of my partners, Mystery Ranch. They're in your backyard. They're right here. So I don't have to go to a trade show to see them. I don't have to fly. We can go to lunch. Yeah, you know, or whenever I, you want to go. Yeah, or I just see them at random events. But yeah, it's like tonight is the Safari Club banquet mm-hmm. here in town. Tomorrow, I'm going to Butte for the Montana Wild Sheep Foundation banquet. Mm-hmm. And so... There's always something like that going on here. And, and so, yeah, no, I appreciate that perspective. Yeah. It's, um, and you know, the, the tough thing, like where, where we're living is it's a constant, it's a constant battle at the ballot for freedom. And, um, you know, and I'm not saying everybody should pick up and move. I, I, you know, I believe in fighting for that freedom in your own state but at some point, you know, for my husband and I were like quality of life, like where can we have a better quality of life? We're getting taxed. The the income taxes in our state are just crazy. Like why am I giving my money to these programs I don't believe in? Right. You know, there's so much power in the purse and if we all control how we spend our money. And I really believe, you know, that's why I'm so proud of the partners I have, like you're proud of the partners you have. Um, spending my money, spending my time promoting and being a part of something that fundamentally believes in the same things that I believe in. And, and that's really important. You know, how we spend our money is important. We control the entire economy with what we buy. And if we're buying stuff from China, (laughs) you know, um, it fuels the Chinese economy when we're not energy independent and we're energy dependent on Russia, guess who we're funding? We're funding the Russian economy. Not we're not funding the American economy, and where we spend our money really fuels the world. And um, so I, it's I think it's more important now than ever that when you buy a backpack or you buy something, you buy it from a company that or clothing or anything, you buy it from a company that fundamentally believes the same things we believe in, so that we can ensure that we have a future. Um, you know, putting the money in in the pockets of of billionaires does not help. Uh, our country you know it helps right. the rich get richer <clears throat> so um it's like like you're saying you know uh, you know you have a lot of partners here i have partners in in wyoming or moving to wyoming and uh, we're seeing a lot more companies kind of come out with made in america which is a tough it's a tough thing to say made in america because it is expensive to make in america and you know i think there's a lot of people that are doing their best to 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 pull away from being dependent overseas on manufacturing and bring that stuff here but unfortunately like on the textile market america is just so far behind um with the equipment and the training and the staffing that they couldn't handle the load if we tried to bring it all here anyway and so there has to be kind of a change in the american work ethic and philosophy as well um of you know maybe don't go to school to to study uh liberal arts ballet ancient whatever (laughs) studies and and actually go to school to learn how to do a trade with your hands and um jason you're an electrician and Mm -hmm. that's something like you and i think is really impressive as you take a measurable pride in the fact that hey 
I keep up with my trade. You continue to do your studies, you know, your, your um, continuing ed so you can maintain that trade because there's nothing more important than somebody that has a skill. You know, when, when we have a winter storm and the power goes out, you know, you could be one of those people that are at someone's house helping them if you needed to, or, or you could fix stuff. And, and there's a lot of um, independence that comes from that. And I think America needs to get back into appreciating the art of work in a lot of capacities too. So, yeah. Yeah. So you mean it's not a good thing to just stay home and not work and get paid from the government? Yeah. You don't think that works out? <laughs> you didn't think we'd be talking <laughs> about this today. I, I go down a rabbit hole on this stuff. So, but uh, no, it is, you know, in, in, it is it is important that we all are, are contributing in our own ways and kind of figuring it out. And, and I think that's what's, you know, for me as a hunter, that's one thing I'm really proud of. Like when, when anti-hunters come at me, a lot of people are like, well, what do you do when you have an anti-hunter attack you? And honestly, I don't really deal with that in my um, brand. Like I have not had uh, PETA and other anti-hunting companies uh, or agencies or whatever you want to call them uh, come after me because the minute somebody attacks me, um, RMEF did a brilliant campaign the hunting is conservation campaign and they did infographics and there was they did infographics specific to each of the 50 states in the United States and then they did supplemental ones and it gave facts of how hunting was relevant to conservation in that particular state and showed the advancement of you know wildlife numbers or acres of access and it was really a brilliant campaign and um I honestly, I would save every one of those graphics. And if somebody would come at me, I would like review those as a slideshow. And forever I had, I had them as a slideshow on my website. And somebody would say something and be like, well, okay, this is what hunters did. And this is where we are now. And, you know, we are buying guns. The taxation through PR dollars is funding conservation. Okay, well, last year I bought hunting license and tag sales. That fueled 75% of state economy. Plus, we're not even talking about free market conservation principles that we're funding through Wild Sheep Foundation, Safari Club International, RMEF, like grassroots efforts. And so when these antis would come at me on my page and I can like say, okay, well, this is what I've done. What have you done? And then you get crickets. And well, this is what I've done. What have you done? Yeah. And if you are an anti and you can't list one activity or one thing from a fundamental standpoint that you have actually done that betters what you claim to be your cause, you're full of hot air. Like there's no go behind you. And and really as hunters, we all have that power to say, look, I personally have contributed to our environment to conservation this is how what have you done and when you turn that table people don't like the reflection um that are casting stones a lot of times they're sure. they don't have an answer well i went down to the animal shelter and i volunteered well that's great for your local animal shelter but what have you done for the cause you're yelling at me for like it's it's hard you know they can't fight it so i really haven't had to deal with that and it's it's um I think if we position ourselves properly as hunters, it's a fight that goes away. It's not a fight. They're, they have no argument. Right. I think I heard an analogy one time that I can't remember who said it, but they said hunters are like, it's like going to a zoo where everybody loves the animals and are, are there to enjoy them. But hunters are like the zoo keepers. Yeah. Their understanding and their knowledge of how to take care of them. And then you have everybody else that's just looking in at the animals that these few individuals are taking care of. And I really like that analogy because everybody there loves the animals mm -hmm. and they want to see them do good. But the people who aren't active in it are like the people behind that glass wall. They they only see They're what observers. you show them, what, what you've created for them to see, you know, and... So I, I really like that analogy, you know, that's like, like the zoo, you know, and we're the zoo keepers and they're the people that buy the ticket and walk through and go home, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think that's very, very simple way to put it um, of what, what's really going on. And it's nice to see, I mean, when I first started doing this and you, I mean, conservation wasn't uh, like a trendy or it wasn't something a lot of people were talking about. No. And now in the hunting community, whether it's the companies themselves giving back or doing these um, 
campaigns for conservation or, you know, just the individuals themselves out there doing podcasts or films or mm-hmm. TV or YouTube are, are more um, active in the conservation space too. So that's good to see. And yeah, it's, um, you, you, I was just talking to somebody down at Hunt Expo that was like, you know, just that one room of people, if you were to remove that one room of people that goes to the dinner banquet on Saturday night mm-hmm. and take them out of the <coughs> equation, I mean, just though, just those people, you take them out of the equation and the entire landscape suffers dramatically. I think like, they raised $13 million over the weekend. Uh, something, I could be incorrect, but it's in that range. Yeah, I just saw something. Range. Um, how much, 11? 11 million or between 11 and 15 million let's say in in two days yeah it's incredible yeah and wild cheap like you say the week before or two weeks weeks before before. that set records they raised 10 million in a few Mm -hmm. days and yeah 15 new records set on tag sales and Hey guys, Christy Titus here. Because I don't have the opportunity to get out on the ground to scout some of my non-resident hunting unit draws, I'm at home doing some e-scouting. Using Onyx Hunt lets me prepare for my upcoming hunts this fall right from my computer. And now you have access to 3D features and functions that are found within the app right on your desktop. Using Onyx Hunt to help you e-scout ahead of time means that when you hit the ground this hunting season, you'll have a better lay of the land so you can spend your time hunting and not trying to figure out where to go. If you haven't already, do yourself a favor and download Onyx Hunt and try it today. So yeah, it's uh, not a lot of people really you know, doing, yeah. doing the work. And I don't think people realize how fragile it is. That's one thing I, I honestly didn't realize until I got into wildlife conservation mm-hmm. at the level that I am is especially sheep. Like you just realize that none of these herds are just out there living their best life without us Absolutely paying any not. attention to them. I mean, every one of those herds is monitored you know, the counts are right on, the amount of study, the research, the, you know, that goes into keeping those sheep healthy. And it, it you really realize how active man is in all facets of wildlife. You There's know? a place we hunt in Colorado and um, the <clears throat> landowner, uh, you know, he has some beautiful rocky canyons and, and he's a tremendous steward too land and um uh his name is bobby hill and he's got a famous ranch called the hill ranch and he owns a plethora of ranches in southern colorado and he worked with colorado parks and wildlife and they took a sheep herd from about 20 miles away and they brought a ram out and a bunch of ewes and they turned them loose in a in a drainage and instantly the ram took off and ran away and (laughs) the the land manager the ranch manager was like well there goes our you know, sheep herd, it's, you know, it's going to fail now. And, and one of the guys doing the reload was like, no, don't worry. That ram will be back and he'll bring more with him. Are you okay, champ? Are we choking? Are you okay? <laughs> um, anyway, he said, you know, they'll, they'll, he'll be back and he'll bring more with him. And in that breeding season, that ram came back and he brought more sheep with him. And the neat thing about that is in a five year span that particular property went from having no sheep to a huntable population of sheep because of the stewardship cooperation between private landowner and uh, parks and wildlife. And there's a lot of people that are like, well, you know, they're only doing paid hunting and this and that. Well, that's not necessarily true because in this particular situation, they also have public tags. So not only is it just a private quote unquote preserve for this rancher because a lot of people will have that misconception public people can come on they draw the tag and actually this this landowner provides guides provides a full service to make sure that the the prop appropriate age is harvested and um the right ram is taken out of the herd and it's 
it's a stewardship that's happening between private landowners also. And it's a public resource that we all get to enjoy. And in a five-year span, you see this entire success model. We, we filmed a podcast sitting there, and there were sheep all over behind us. And you couldn't see them because it was cliffs and sure um, with, you know, just the bare optic. But they were there, and, and that wasn't there five years ago. And it's the – and there is a big – there is a big battle, obviously, between public and private and in in public land management is a big issue um, where you see, especially in places like Oregon, where our, our understory is so uh, dense that the sunlight never hits the forest floor and there's nothing for ungulates to eat. So they all filter into uh, timber company property, which is privately held property that's better managed. And, um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic of what private landowners are really doing to benefit wildlife, but it's also really controversial when a public resource tends to want to keg up on a private landscape, and it's frustrating for the public. Um, but a lot of that goes into public land management too, where we're seeing you know states that try to do um, land improvement projects or forest thinning projects, and then you have um, purist groups that come in and sue the states and say you know you can't cut a tree or you can't harvest burnt timber and and so you end up with all these litigation fights and then nothing gets done and it's so frustrating um you know I would love to see the hands of some of our management uh be unchained to where we can do what's really good for uh, not just a purist setting but for a management setting so that animals can benefit in 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 force can benefit the health of forests and stuff can benefit and, and some of that comes with you know man has to get in there and and do things we yeah. have to be able to work yeah for sure and i mean if 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 you don't mother nature will find out a way either you know the beetle will come in or mm -hmm. the fire will hit it or it'll clean it up somehow but yeah. but yeah i mean it's like Shane Mahoney somebody I look up to a lot and you know he's one of his lines that sticks out to me is private land is the new frontier for wildlife management right. because yeah the public is a tough place to manage anything because you have all these varying opinions on what should be happened and mm -hmm. or what should happen and because of that nothing usually does happen and meanwhile you know you got ranchers that are doing water improvements. They're putting water tanks on top of ridges mm -hmm. that haven't had water and they're, you know, spraying for noxious weeds and they're cutting their timber when they need to cut their timber and they're planting seed here and they're, I mean, they're, their job is to make that land flourish. That's how they make a living. So the better job they do at providing something for their cattle, the better job they're doing providing things for the wildlife yeah. and as a result, yeah, where do you think things want to be? I mean, and, and yeah, so it's it's definitely, like you say, a, a created a lot of heated conversations about public resource, you know, being held on private grounds and how, to, how do we access that as the public. And, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's if we make decisions based on what's best for the wildlife and the habitat, then everybody will benefit. You know, if you try to take out these voices or opinions that come in from the public side or the private side or the state agency or, you know, there's just all these opinions. Like if you just really fundamentally go, OK, what's best for the elk in this area? What's best for the landscape? What's you know, you make decisions for that and that only, then, yeah, the public land hunter, the private land guy, everybody benefits mm -hmm. from that. It's really important who your wildlife commissioners are in your state, too. So putting pressure, your governor appoints those. Putting pressure on your governor to appoint qualified commissioners. Um, and there are governors that appoint a diverse commission, um, that doesn't necessarily see 100% as hunting is the answer or anything in particular agenda-wise is the answer. There are a lot of governors that that present and, and incorporated a more diverse commission, um, which can be frustrating um, when we have a voice that maybe doesn't agree with the one that we would have ourselves. And But some governors do that um, to have an open debate 
Um, and so that all groups end up wanting to feel like they've been heard in that forum. Um, and I understand that philosophy, but I'm always one-sided and I want my governors to appoint the commissioners <laughs> with the agenda that I have. And um, so, I mean, it's really important for people. If you don't like your wildlife commission, you need to talk to your governor. You know, if you don't like how wildlife is being managed, if you don't like how tags are being allocated or the decisions that are being made, your governor is responsible ultimately for that. And some states, like mine, we don't have a good governor. And the people they put on the commission, I don't necessarily agree with. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing, but all we can do is go to those entities, get involved, and have our voice heard. And the commissioner's meetings, a lot of them are virtual. Um, some of them are in person. And you'd be surprised how many people on the anti side, and we're getting attacked this spring alone. Washington saw it. Arizona saw it. New Mexico saw it. Colorado saw it. For predator hunting it was just hammered. Um and hunters historically haven't been showing up at these commissioner meetings. We've kind of just relaxed, like, oh, yeah, we have hunting season. It's good. You know, we hunt bears. We do this. Well, then once we get the other opponents in there and they're being vocal, they're doing emails, they're making noise, well, these governors and these commissions have to hear both sides. And a lot of times they'll give in to the side that they hear most from. And that has to be from hunters. I mean, if we really want to – have a say in what happens then we have to have a say and that means every one of us getting involved at some capacity you know if you don't want to show up write a letter make a phone call we all have it in within our power to to spearhead the change that we want to see and not just expect somebody else to do it and we're really lucky we have a lot of wildlife agencies like safari club international you know they have a political action committee in washington dc that's fighting with NRA and NRA has kind of a rocky standing in a lot of communities right now, but NRA does a heck of a lot for hunters that goes very unspoken. And I mean, the second amendment is the, the front lines of conservation and they are the number one organization protecting that, but they also have their own pack in DC and um, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation also is, is pretty active. But on the political side, everything that we have the right to do or not do comes from our lawmakers. And we all have to get involved, know who these people are, find out how the appointment processes are held, and do something about it if we don't like what we're it, it, we, complaining about it to our friends is doing absolutely nothing. You know, if you don't like what I have to say, that's fine. Don't agree with what I have to say pick up the phone, write a letter, and tell your commissioner, tell your governor, hey, I don't like these things that we're doing in the state, or I don't like this opinion. This is my opinion. This is why. It, without your voice, you have nothing. And that's why the First Amendment is so important. And we're seeing that shut down, you know, on social media <clears throat> everywhere, really. Um, but we still have a First Amendment, and it's up to us to exercise it. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people just don't think as an individual they can do anything and you know but collectively yeah we lock step the way they do you know and and you'll see this across the board every news network they lock step and they'll come out with a narrative and a talking point and they hammer it into the public until that's what the public thinks is reality or fact and they hammer it hammer it hammer it and then it is we, if we don't do that, if all of our nonprofits don't, you know, really get together, if all hunters don't really get together in lockstep in the same respect and hammer it, hammer it, hammer it, hunting is conservation, we are stewards of the land, guns are good, this is why we're, we are at detrimental risk of losing that stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, we have to become more organized, uh, more vocal, more involved I mean, even down to school boards, like Jason, you have little kids, the importance of being involved in your school boards right now. Um, Wyoming did a, a shooting sports class where they were teaching safe firearms handling and in, in, it went national news. People were just freaking out. And there's a state I saw this week that they're looking at passing Hunter Ed in school curriculum. And there's I saw that. people freaking out. We need to be going to our school boards saying, hey, we want our kids to have a shooting sports program because there's a lot of kids that aren't athletic that 
can shoot guns um, and do it well and safely. Um, there's a lot of kids that want to do hunter ed and do basic field courses. Why not offer that in schools? And as hunters, if we want to see those programs um, implemented archery in schools, we have to go to our school boards. You know, we have to put those programs out there and no one's going to do it for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's uh, kind of what it makes me think of is the recent, you know, kind of scuttle in the hunting community about social media, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether we should be on there, whether we shouldn't, all that stuff. And I mean, I, for one, think it's absolutely crucial that yeah. hunters stay on social and because it is the one place that we have a chance to get our message in front of people who aren't going to just tune in otherwise. And, yeah. it, and it's a free platform. You know, some people do abuse it. Some people do things on there that do make hunters look bad. Absolutely. <clears throat> but overall, it's a powerful tool and we need to use it because if all hunters just backed off a of social, there would be, nobody would see that messaging. You know, the people who don't hunt aren't going to turn on Sportsman's Channel and watch a show to learn that. They're not going to tune no. in to, you know, to things to learn that. So but I've, they might catch a glimpse of your reel. Yeah, or, exactly. Uh, Something a like that. A short film, you know, a 60 second clip that you put on there about how hunting is conservation or shooting sports is Exactly. Beneficial. You don't know where that's going to end up. No. And so, you know, I think it's important we stay on there, but with that in that same breath, it's super important that we're very like self-policing of ourselves of mm -hmm. what we do put on there, mm -hmm. you know, cause it is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all the good that can be done with it, you know, there's, there's harm too. So just thinking about not just what that, and I put this, this is the equation I put into every show, every film, every post, every single thing I do is what would that, been there, done that, diehard guy, like to see and appreciate, but also a person that's never once seen hunting, if they see it, what would their perception be? And I put as much thought into what the diehard guy would like to see as I do the guy that's never once seen hunting. Mm -hmm. And because of that, because I never want a post or a video or a clip or anything that I do. I, I do this because I want to leave it better than I found it. Yeah. I don't want to let sit back and let, like, like you say, just assume somebody else is going to do it for me. I want these messages to be out there and it's important for me to get them out there. I don't want to rely on anybody else. And, and, um, you know, part of that is, really putting thought into every single piece of it and um, collectively just having this message of how hunting is conservation. And so I think if people can put their egos in their, you know, wanting to be the biggest, baddest hunter who goes further and harder and deeper and stays longer and shoots the biggest animals. Are you talking about me? Oh, wait, no, no, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Clearly that's not true. <laughs> I mean, I think if people put that aside when they think of a post and they want to, you know, I think if they think about the non-hunter when they word that post or they pick that picture more than they yeah. do trying to impress their peers, I think that's important, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not trying to preach. It's just, that's my opinion. And I think it would go a long ways if everybody thought that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I don't shy away from social media. I don't shy away from grip and grins. No. I don't shy. I'm proud of it. I, you know, I try to show things clean. I don't want, to, you know, there to be a lot of excess blood or the tongue hanging out or beers in the picture or just things that give people fuel. I make sure to not have those. But at the same time, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's nothing fake about taking my boy hunting. And the first thing he does is grab it and is just like, yeah picks it up and is just like grinning ear to ear and just so happy looking at it. Like that's not a fake, that is real. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to explain. I get the fact that the, you know, an anti sees you smiling with a dead animal. It casts this weird impression, but man, it's real. And it is like one of the few things in life that is truly real. And mm -hmm. it, and like, 
so primal and just, yeah. I mean, it's hard, it is really, really hard to explain. It's what we all try to do all the time. And, um, but you know, kids don't lie. They don't fake. They, you know, they, they are the real deal. And when you, when you see a boy kill his first deer, even his third deer, even me, at <laughs> 43, the, I mean, you can't help but to just feel this sense of gratification and yeah. pride and joy. And it's not a look at what I killed kind of smile. It's just this whole, um, you know, what it does to your soul and the feeling of like doing what, you know, um, naturally you're put on earth to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it feels good because of that. And, um, yeah, so I think it's super important and to be that voice on social, but to constantly remind people why don't just put out a picture of you, you know, for no reason, make sure there's context, make sure people understand why that's important mm -hmm. to you. And I think, yeah these little things that we've talked about are all sort of our evolution. Like we said in the beginning of this, of us trying to figure out and evolve and kind of always have that message there, mm -hmm. you know, it is changing and the attacks on our way of life are changing and. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Stop that ridiculous singing, Hank. But Larry, we got to celebrate Tink's 50th. Celebrate? That dang Tink's is why we're up on this wall. Come on, Larry. In honor of the golden anniversary, it's time to pop a cork on a bottle of Tink 69. Tink 69? It's not champagne. You don't drink it, you idiot. Whoa, just the smell is making me tipsy, Larry. That Tink 69 is liquid love. Tink's, America's oh, number oh, one buck lure for 50 years. I give up. First dibs on Larry's Tink's. I, I can't do this anymore. I'm always up for Tink's. So, and we're having to adapt to all of these things, you know, and, um, in some capacity, um, we have, you know, so many more concerns with travel and everything now, um, than we've ever had. But I think we also have a greater appreciation after having gone through COVID for wild places and space than we've ever had. I mean, I, my heart breaks for kids that are living in an apartment in the city and have never experienced what you look out your back door and see every day. And it, it really becomes important for us also to become mentors because um, there's groups out there like First Hunt Foundation that take first time hunters, whether they're 12 or 70 on their first hunt. And I, honestly, the reason I want to move to Wyoming is I went to the Wyoming Women's Antelope Camp and they had 45 women there. Some were experienced hunters, some were first time hunters, some women were, you know, dealing with battling cancer or they'd lost a husband or you know whatever whatever they were going through in life some people just wanted to go there and go hunting and hang out with their girlfriends but it it the people that it changes life the, you know those experiences that happen in camp and happen on the mountain um it changes lives you see it with 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 veterans you know they they maybe have uh, combat injuries and and they think that you know they've lost the ability to do some things and they rediscover how able you are to accomplish things on the mountain that maybe you thought you'd lost the ability to do I, I did a hunt a couple of years ago with my girlfriend Ashley Lundvall who's a tremendous human being um, a, an incredible role model completely paralyzed and she's still getting out there and bird hunting and we went elk hunting and um, you know there there is so much uh, therapeutic benefit to being in the mountains and and I think it's really important that we take little kids that are from maybe urban areas or single family homes and influence those kids and show them what and how powerful and how special the outdoors are and um, you know, finding those programs, like I'm not a mother, but you know, I like to help mentor, uh, people. Like I have this boyfriend, um, I call him, his name is Bridger. He's 11 and, um, and he's got some, um, birth issues where he's got a lot of joint flexibility that causes him a lot of problems with walking and stuff. And, um, he went on a mule deer hunt, a guy on the Arizona strip had one, a tag and it wasn't a good strip year I guess so he donated it to a to a disabled person to go experience the Arizona strip and Bridger went and killed just a monster buck this year and 
And he's this tiny little kid who has dealt with adversity at every challenge of his life. He didn't learn to walk till he was almost four years old and everything's been hard for him. And I mean, he's learning through hunting that he can do anything he wants. And for his 12th birthday, I can't wait to take that kid deer hunting. Like, we have it planned. It's a date. Yogi gets to go. He's going to be the third wheel. <laughs> uh, but he's going to go. But, I mean, taking people from any capacity, like as hunters, I think there's not a greater gift we can give anyone than our time. And whether you're giving it to a kid who lives in a city and, you know, their parents aren't investing in them, um, and taking and investing time in, in those types of people, um, and especially kids, like, man, everybody wants to be loved and cared for. And the hunting community has this great opportunity. And there's, I don't think there's a place where I feel more loved in this world than in hunting camp with my friends or more important. Um, the most important people in my life are the people that I spend my time with in hunting camp. And um, just making the time for someone that may not have that in their own home um, is so important right now especially if we want to change the the conversations that are being had around hunting which is why I think it's so important that we get hunter ed back in schools shooting sports back in schools get our nonprofits and our volunteers reintegrated into these kids and reinvesting in these kids that that are living in an apartment and they've never been around a campfire. They don't know what they're missing. How do you vote as an adult for something that you've never experienced, you know, and support right. that when you don't understand it? So, um, I don't know. I don't know how I just got off on that, but, uh, it's, it's just such an important time for all of that right now. Um, with everything we're doing and, uh, we're in Montana. It's, big sky country it's beautiful here you're so blessed to live here we're so blessed to where everybody in this country is blessed with the opportunity to come to montana to come out west to come to our public lands and experience this and um boy it's something that it's it's there's nothing like this anywhere else in the world i can promise you that you know um yeah no matter how much i travel or leave to go to these destination places for cool hunts or be with great people I'm always happy to come back I'm always really really happy to fly over the mountain and see that bridge or skyline or you know driving down the interstate and you first see that skyline of the bridgers I mean that's home to me you know yeah. it always has been so I uh very much a creature of habit so I'll uh yeah I'll be here as as long as as I can and you know it supports me that's for sure Jason, how can like everybody, they want to watch your shows, they want to watch past episodes, they want to binge through um, and watch what you're doing. Where do people, where can people do that? Send, send everybody somewhere. So, I mean, all my newest TV show episodes come out on my outdoor TV. Which is, it's called Into High Country. It is, yep. My TV show is called Into High Country. Um, we do come on the Sportsman's Channel um, from July to December on Monday nights as our prime time spot. But when we're off air, like right now, all those shows go to My Outdoor TV, MOTV. It's an app, mm -hmm. mobile app. It has all my past, uh, I think there's eight or nine seasons on there of the TV show. Um, so you can see a lot of it there. And then as far as like my... You know, a lot of the short film work that I've done, vignette type stuff, and some of the shows, my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. just Jason Matzinger. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of it on there. And then, you know, really, whether it's RMEF or Wild Sheep or Mule Deer, I have a lot of work on their pages as well. So mm -hmm. those would be like the, the main places to catch what I do mm -hmm. for sure. Outstanding. So you guys, thank you for uh, joining us on this Friday morning for Coffee Talk. With Jace. Yeah. <laughs> took, That's a rocket line. Yeah. I know. I, I took that from him after, <laughs> after our conversation this morning. Uh, it's pretty funny. He's a fun guy. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining us uh, for this episode of Wild and Uncut in Jason's living room. Uh, <laughs> Pre-shower, pre-breakfast, post-coffee <laughs> is all that matters. It was a good good talk, and I appreciate your time and your willingness to, to come on here and, and talk to... Uh, the people that are tuning in. So it's, we value that a lot. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks and for the opportunity. That you're doing. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. Heck yeah. Peace out. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.